Um, hi everyone. So yeah, I'm, I'm Mike. I'm an astronomer by training, but I'm also doing a lot of remote sensing now in a startup company called Aspia Space. And I'm going to be talking about how we can use large observation models, not large language models, but large observation models to predict future satellite observations. Um, so just a meme to begin. I'm sure you all feel like this. Uh, there's a lot of talk about LLMs going around, but this isn't going to be an LLM talk. This is going to be a adjacent talk to LLMs, so about large observation models and how we can use alternate data sources to train these large models. I, so we trained a model, a GPT model, which is an autoregressive transformer model. And all this is, is a big neural network, and it's trying to predict the next item in a sequence. So this is what a GPT-3, 4, 1, 2, uh, a chat GPT is under the hood. It's a lot of decoding transformer layers, which is a, a neural network layer. It's a big matrix multiplier, and it takes in a sequence of tokens or words or time series or anything else. And it tries to predict the next item in the sequence. So you can see here we have a sentence about galaxy with five spiral alarms. And the model is just trying to predict the next word in a sentence by training on a huge amount of data, loads and loads of text. And if you do this, it turns out you get some very cool emergent properties in the model as well. So if you train on enough text and enough imagery, the model learns just by learning the next word in a sentence. It learns stuff about zoology. So you can see at the top, this is from the Flamingo model, which is a model that came out of Google DeepMind a couple of years ago. And it's just trained autoaggressively to predict the next word in a sentence on a load of textual data. But you can see that it actually learned what Flamingo is, where they're found. They're found in the Caribbean and South America. It learned stuff about art. So I, I don't know where that painting, where the city where that painting was painted, but the model knows just from learning the next word in the sentence on a large corpus of data. It can read text, so it can take that image, read that, yeah, this word says solums. It can do maths as well, because it needs to learn all of these, all of these abilities to be able to predict the next word in the sentence better and better, which is what its objective is. So you can get some very, very cool emergent properties from these data from these models just by training on lots of data. That's the take home message here. So I'm going to be talking about two models in particular here. And I'm going somewhere with this, so bear with me for a second. So on the left-hand side, yeah, on the left-hand side there, there's a model called Chinchilla, which is a smaller model with 7 billion parameters, 7 billion neurons in the neural network. And on the right-hand side, there's a model called Gopher. And this is a much larger model than Chinchilla, um, billions and billions of parameters. And there will be a little thing in a second saying how big they are. So Gopher has 280 billion parameters. This is around the size of a GPT-3 model. Uh, and it's been trained on 300 billion words or tokens of data. And Chinchilla uh, has been trained on 100 1,400 billion tokens of data or words of data. And it's only 7 billion parameters big. So it's much smaller than Gopher. And when these papers came out, when Chinchilla came out, um, the thinking was the bigger the model, the better it is. It doesn't really matter about the data set size. And when Chilla came, Chinchilla came out, they proved this wrong. So they actually proved that you need around 20 tokens per neural neuron in your neural network to be able to train it optimally. So Gopher's bigger than Chinchilla, but Chinchilla's better than Gopher because it's trained on more data. It's trained on more diverse data, more data, so it works better. And here's just a plot from the paper. You don't need to read all that, but blue is good. Blue means Chinchilla beat Gopher. And on the x-axis, you have like diverse topics like astronomy or uh, conceptual physics right at the end there, high school mathematics, it beats Gopher on questions uh, from all of these topics just because it's been trained on more data and it's more compressed in the model. So this is great, right? Oh, hang on, not yet. It's not yet great. I'm going to explain what a neural scaling law is first. 
So neural scaling law is something that relates the number of tokens in the model, how big the model is, and the number of uh, data, uh, data tokens it's been trained on, and the model performance, which is L min there. So the parameter term is the size of the model, the data term is the amount of data it's been trained on, and the data set entropy is some constant that can't be reduced. And Hoffman et al, the Gopher paper, the Chinchilla paper, they took this equation and they fitted it and they got these parameters in there. And this doesn't mean much in itself, but I'm gonna show you a graph in the next slide that shows you something I found quite cool. And if you look at this and you step back for a second and you look on the x-axis, that's the model size. On the y-axis, you have the data set size. And you can see here, if you add more data um, to, the, to the data set axis, it will move towards the bottom left corner, which is where you want to be. This is the minimum loss or the maximum performance of the model. And on the x-axis, you're not gonna really get much improvement by making these neural network models bigger at this point. So you can see here I've plotted Chinchilla, Palm, GPT-3, and other large language models. But if you really want to improve these models at this point, you wanna add more data. So you, you wanna go and find more data on the internet or other corpuses and put them into these models and reduce the y-axis of this graph so that they perform better. So why don't we just go do this? Why don't we just go and get loads more data and train these models and they get better? It turns out there's not enough data on the internet to do this. So you, yeah, so where else can we go? We can use synthetic data or we can keep scraping the surface web, which tends to be of low quality. It's conversations between people. It's not like archive papers or GitHub code. Um, so Villa Lobos found in 2022, they predicted that we're gonna run out of high quality internet data by 2028, so in a couple of years time. So there's gotta be other places to get this data from, right? And it turns out, if you look at the observational sciences, there's a lot of data there that isn't being used to train these large models. So clear sky is an algorithm that removes cloud cover from satellite observation imagery in the visible to near infrared bands, and that's something we've been working on at Aspia Space. And if you take that Copernicus Sentinel data, you have 140 trillion high quality Earth observation tokens you can then use to train these models. And in astronomy too, this is to do with astronomy as well, you've got the LSST, which is a large, uh, large telescope that's gonna be observing the night sky very soon. In astronomy, it's always very soon when the telescope's gonna see first light, but very soon we're gonna have the LSST running and it's gonna generate 12 billion VIT tokens, which is a 16 by 16 pixel patch of the night sky per night, and that's a lot of data. Uh, around 4.4 trillion tokens per year, which is rivaling, when I wrote this <laughs> a year or so ago, is rivaling the largest textual data sets. Uh, if you add it all together, it will dwarf them. So this is a lot of data that's not being used. So wh why don't we just use it? Why don't we put it in an autoregressive model and see what happens? And this is, this is what we did. Um, so you can actually use any kind of data in a large autoregressive model. So this is the Gatto paper. Uh, and what they showed here is that you can take Atari games, you can take tokens um, of text, of chat, of uh, a robotic arm operating and picking up cubes and placing them down in different places. A time series, you can just put it all into a single model and the model doesn't care where the tokens came from, it just works. You can just put in a load of data, say, it's, it's got to be structured, but you can just put in the data as structured and it will predict the next token in the sequence and it does it well. And at some point, the multimodal data sets, the models trained on the multimodal data sets outperform the unimodal data sets, which I found very, very cool. So it's not just for funsies, it's actually improving the models if you take all of this data and plug it in. So, I hope I convinced you that we can take Earth observation and astronomy data and put it in and see what happens. So I'm gonna talk about two models, Earth PT, which is why you're all here, and also Astro PT in a second, which is a similar technique we apply to astronomy data. 
SPT is a little bit more easy to visualize, so I'll start with this. So uh, we use the clear sky algorithm to remove cloud cover from Sentinel-2 data. Sentinel-2 is just a visible to near-infrared RGB near-infrared uh, observation of the Earth from a satellite. And so if the satellite passes over, you get an observation of the same patch of ground every few days or so. So then you can turn them over and have a time series of the same patch of ground and then pass this into the model. So we have an un uninterrupted cloud-free time series of data we can just put into these models. Um, so little diagram to get everyone's brain like visualizing this. So you can have an observation on November 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th and try and predict the observation on November 6th. So that's what this model is. It's the same as a GPT, but instead of text going in, it's time series going in. So we found that it could forecast the future, which I found very, very cool. Uh, so these are four different plots of different indices that farmers are interested in. Uh, NDVI is to do with vegetation how Vedante patch of ground is. WI is the amount of water on a patch of ground. BSI is the bare soil index, so how unverdant a patch of ground is. And GCVI is also another vegetation index. And you can see across all of these, it predicts, we tested it up to five months in the future, but we don't know exactly how far it can go yet. This is for further testing, but I was very happy with this. And just to reiterate, it doesn't explicitly learn any of this stuff. We're just trying to predict the next item in a sequence, the next item in a time series, just like a GPT model is trying to predict the next word in a sentence. The embeddings are meaningful. So if you take the outputs of the penultimate layer of the neural network and project it onto a 2D space and color them by some emergent properties of the time series, like how much vegetation is there, how much bare soil is there, or the RGB color at the height of summer, you can see there's some structure that the neural network's learned just from predicting the next item in a sequence. And if you um, average these over 2023, this shows that it's not just like memorizing stuff, it's actually learning something important and relevant about the data. So we trained several FPT models from 10 million parameters to 700 million parameters just to see if it gets better as the model gets bigger. It turns out it does, just like a, a natural language neural network. And the very interesting thing for me here is that the models still look like they're improving at the end of the training run. So there's still much, much more to squeeze from these models. We're actually scanning it up right now with a load more data of the whole UK just to see how far we can push this, how much we can throw at these models and see how, how good they can get. So this is the, the money plot for EarthPT. So we trained a model up until May of, uh, no, up until July of 2022. And we then took the trained model and said, predict the next six months in advance. And the black line is the ground truth, and the green dashed line is a prediction. And it turns out it predicted the 2022 UK drought just from seeing the historic time series and learning from this and learning the patterns in it without us telling it what a drought is, of course. It's just learning, again, a very simple metric, the next item in a sequence. Um, so if it can do this, what else can it do? Can it predict, um, can it predict uh, flooding events and other things? This is something we're working on now. We know it can predict drought, but what else, what else is hidden behind the surface? It's all open source, so you can check it out. There's a GitHub repository. Uh, there's an archive paper as well describing the model if you guys are interested. It's all written in Python and PyTorch. Uh, contributions are welcome if anyone fancies it. Um, I'll, I'll share the slides as well, just in case someone doesn't manage to get a picture of this, I'll put it on the, on the Discord. And finally, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about AstroPT, which is a passion project of mine. So this is EarthPT, this is my day job, and then AstroPT is just something I find very cool because I used to be an astronomer. 
Um, so yep, LSST, lots of data in astronomy. Astro PT is a very similar concept, but instead of predicting the next item in a time series, we're predicting the next item of a galaxy image. In a bunch of galaxy images, it was, we took nine million galaxy images from DESI DR8, this is just an astronomy survey, and we wanted to see if the model gets better, as it gets bigger, it gets more data. And again, this is just predicting, so from zero and one you predict two in this patch, spiral sequence of patches, it's not doing anything fancy, it's trying to predict the next patch in the sequence here. And I'm gonna have some graphs to point at you <laughs> right now, just to show that it works. Turns out it does. So x-axis is the model size, y-axis is how good it does at predicting the next patch. Um, yep, so it sees 10 billion galaxies, it improves up until around 90 million parameters, which I found interesting. I wonder why it stops there. I think it's something to do with the data information density. Um, this is something I'm testing now, so seeing if you take some other observations of galaxies, say spectral lines or something like this, and see if it continues to go down, if that's a more dense data set. Um, again, this is the emergent property thing we saw for Earth PT, but this time it's for galaxy astronomy properties. So MGZ, are the brightness of the galaxy. Uh, G minus R and R minus Z are the colors in different bands. Redshift is the distance to the galaxy. SSFR is how many stars are born uh, per year in this galaxy. Uh, M star is the mass of the galaxy. And then the rest of them are just parameters of how the galaxy looks, whether it's smooth, whether it's disky, whether there's some weird artifacts going on there. And it turns out the model learns this just by predicting the next item in the spiral uh, observations of the galaxy. It gets better as it gets bigger too, in the emergent properties. So this is very neat. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not just an academic exercise. You can actually take this and use it for real astro things to predict the brightness or the color of the galaxy or even the amount of stars born per year in this galaxy. And it learns all this just from predicting the next item in a sequence. We don't have to do anything fancy, we just throw the data at it and it learns it just an emergent property, just like the language models do. Uh, this is also all open source and this time there's a Discord where people can get involved if you guys are interested. We're trying to build it out to be super multimodal now, so this is something that's in the works, so we're gonna not just have galaxies, we're gonna have star time series and all of this stuff going into these models. Um, so this is gonna be my final slide, the next one. So I think I've left enough time for some questions. So if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Um, just to summarize, the current foundation models are limited by data set size and not by model size, so we need more data. There's not enough textual data, so where do we get it from? We can get it from uh, observational modalities like astronomy, like Earth observation, anything like this. So, thanks everyone. Perfect, so you know the drill. Uh, there's a microphone. Just step up and ask questions. Um, in the meantime, let, let me ask a naive, maybe dumb question. I'm not from the field, so uh, you said it gets better with more data. Yep. Is there some correlation? I don't know, does more data means just the same, more better, or? It, so there, there was a paper that just came out last month, I think, and I used gzip as a compression metric to see how compressible the data is. And it turns out if it's less compressible, so more information dense, you need less data to get the same performance, which makes sense, right? So. It depends on the data set, which is why I don't think the Galaxy model scaled as far as we thought it would do when we started the experiments. Nice, thank you. Then please go ahead. Um, I have two small questions. Um, first one is, um, you mentioned it was a hobby project. Mm -hmm. Is it then not expensive to run this? I can imagine like with that much data, it's... Uh... It's, so we, we needed, four big GPUs to run this. 
but you can take the model and fine tune it on a local computer. We, we knew some people at universities that would help us out <laughs> to give us some GPUs. Um, but yeah, once it's trained, it's, it's very cheap to deploy. So you can use all of the, the standards, Llama libraries for this because it's just a GPT model under the hood. Okay, and the uh, second one, if you go back to the slide of your, uh, of the Astro, um, the, yeah, the, the things this it one? was, that the, um, yeah, the things it had learned, like, so the, the uh, patches. That's yeah. one, yeah. No, one back. So. Okay. Um, there's like two classes here. Ah, yes. <laughs> I, I was wondering, are there like two types of galaxies then, or? So this was a mystery when, <laughs> when we were training this and we, we were pulling our hairs out like, what's going on here? Why are there two islands? And I, I should have mentioned this, I forgot to mention it. And it turns out one of them is the northern hemisphere and one of them is the southern hemisphere. And the telescopes in each hemisphere have a slightly different noise profile. So it separated them out in the latent space, which is what you're seeing here. So yeah, I was like, why is this? And it turns out it's just like, yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, first of all, thank you for your talk. That's super interesting. Um, for the Earth observation ones, mm -hmm. um, one of the trends that at least I think we've been seeing over the past few years is that people's models of how Earth develops with climate change uh, are generally like under-representing the changes. Do you think that this is something that your model is likely to, to also suffer, or is there some reason that it is likely to be able to deal with that better? Um, it, it depends how prominent these changes are in the data set, because at this point the model, we're, we're not putting any human pushing in the model, so it's, if it's in a data set, it should pick up on it. I, I'm not sure without doing some testing exactly how it would affect it, so yeah, but this is something yeah to keep in mind. Fair, Cause, yeah. uh, and so I guess kind of a half half note question after yeah. that then is um, one of the I guess one of the things that we're kind of worried about is um, this like domino effect where one big thing happens and then knocks a bunch of other big things. Presumably at that point we get to like the edges of this model if we're reaching those kind of like yeah. unforeseen um, knock-ons. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Pass the next person. Uh, hey, nice talk. I thought it was really interesting in the, uh, the use of GPTs for time series forecasting. Um, I presume you compared that against more traditional time series forecasting models and found that to be best. Is, is that right? We, we compared it against LSTM and also a simple phase folded model per year and it outperformed them. Um, I'll need to dig in. It's, it's all in the paper, but I'll need to dig in to find the actual numbers for you, but it did, it did do better, yeah. Cool, yeah, I'll check out the paper, thanks. Um, second question, some in the charts, they had like a really cool style, like a hand-drawn kind of thing. I was ah, wondering ones. how you did that, yeah, I think that's pretty nifty. You just do import uh, XKCD from matplotlib or something, and then it, it does it all, and it looks like an XKCD graph, yeah. Oh cool, yeah, <laughs> I'll look into that. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, I have a question on the weather data when you showed the drought. The weather data? Weather data, uh, yeah. Uh, this one, yeah, this, this the one? one with the throat, where you do the prediction six months afterwards. Uh, this one, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm trying to understand this. So essentially, you look at the land, at the earth, and you predict what happens in the sky. Because the drought is, in a sense, the result of the rain. Yes. I wanted to, to ask if you have any kind of KPIs, if you have tried this predicting the past and establish a kind of, let's say, more solid evidence than one, one case. Because yep. I, I, I don't understand really how can one connect the two things, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, so I, I think the, well, this is my, my head canon. <laughs> so I think the, the model in viewing the ground, it has to learn something about the climate surrounding it just to be able to know what the ground's going to look like at a certain point in time. So it must learn something about the historic uh, weather patterns of this area. And this is where I think this comes from. So it can recognize, oh, this has happened earlier in the year. This normally happens in a drought year, all of this stuff. But yeah, you're right. It does need more evidence than a single case study. Um, this is something that we're working on now at Aspia Space. So hopefully very soon we'll have like 
yeah, more more data to throw at this. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I'm just interested in how well the models work in some um, like extreme circumstances. As I would guess, if we put in enough data, it would learn from the year to year on what, like in the summer, that it is how the how it looks and how it looks in winter. But in I don't know in some extreme uh, situations like extreme rainstorms mm -hmm. in the summer, does it work? Does it not? <laughs> Intuitively. If it's not in the data set, I don't think it would work. But if it's if these extreme events are historical, I imagine it would work. But I haven't tested it okay. properly myself. Yeah, it has the same drawbacks that like GPT in text has. So if like, you know, in text, if you ask it something that's completely out of distribution, it won't know what's going on. Yeah. Similar to this, but if if it's seen it before, I would imagine it would be able to predict what's going on. Okay. And uh, does the predictive power like? I don't know, if we would just predict for next week, maybe it would work better? Did you maybe test on that or? Uh? Yeah, so, well, I, I guess you can see on this mm -hmm. plot, it does much better uh -huh. closer to the dashed line, which is where the version to state was. So we trained it up until this dashed line and we said, predicts what's next. And then it starts to diverge later on. It starts to do the average per year. Um, so yeah, closer to the divergence state, it does better, and then further away, it starts to wobble around. Thanks. Yep. Following on from them questions, uh, how useful do you think it's going to be uh, with climate change coming into effect? Do you think it'd be more or less useful because things are a bit more unpredictable? Um, I'm hoping it will be more useful. This is part of the reason we're investigating this, is to create some something that can predict like events before they happen for farmers to be able to like I don't know put more nitrogen uh, fertilizer on their soil or to anticipate a drought or something like this and then do something to prevent it um, again if it's historical if it's some black swan climate event it's probably not going to be able to predict it but if it's historical and it's shown in the data for example if it's getting slightly more wild each year it should be able to predict it I, I guess the proof is in the pudding, so if it's deployed wide scale, we'll see exactly how well it does and where it falls down. So I think it needs to be deployed to be able to find out exactly where the drawbacks are and where the positives are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Uh, hey, me again. Um, different question. Uh, yeah. Is the data that you get from this indicative of like weather could you basically use this as a type of weather prediction yep. as in it's going to rain on tuesday uh, may, maybe not <laughs> but the, the model is super flexible so if you have a bunch of weather data that's from some i don't know iot's on the ground of like precipitation it should be able to do this and we actually tried a moisture predictor with a gpt model and it works fine um and i think the more modern weather prediction algorithms are moving in this direction now. So they're moving into GPTs to predict what's going on a little bit down the line. I think they're using mostly mass also encoders. But yeah, yeah, it should work. You'd need the right data to throw at it. Um, this is secondary weather prediction because it's, yeah. it's looking at the ground. And it's like, oh, this weather predicts the ground. But like, there's like several layers. And yeah. if you just predict the weather directly, if that's what you're interested in, it'll be much easier for the model to learn this. Cool. That's fair. Cheers. Hello, I also have a new question. Um, yeah. Do you also add other, in, uh, add other data like topographic maps uh, of like the, the Earth or is it only time series? It's at this point any data we can throw at it. So we're working on a new model that can take in uh, data from different satellites. It, it's taken in elevation as well. Um, IoT objects and all of this stuff. So like like I was saying at the start, more data is good data. The model doesn't care where it comes from. It just does its thing. It chugs along. And you can put it all into the same model like they did with Gatto. And it, it just seems to work. OK, thanks. Yeah, thank you for all the great questions. I think yeah. you're walking around here. So yeah. if you have any more, just grab, uh, grab him. Um, then please give it up again uh, for Mike.